Right, let's go for it. Okay, uh, something very obvious. Every day, every day, you are being asked to buy into a vision for your life from somewhere. So it could be the nice advertising men on telly who say, you buy this yoghurt and you'll be a supermodel. If you, I suppose you eat it and then starve yourself and don't do anything else. But yeah, buy into this vision of my product. Um, perhaps you're talking with mates and saying, do you know what, I want a holiday. I'm already so looking forward to my holiday. Because you buy into the vision that if you have that holiday, it will bring relief, it will bring rest, it will bring a whole new you, possibly. Uh, you buy into the vision that actually if you get on that bus and buy that bus ticket, they, that bus will get you to the destination on time. So every day we've been asked to buy into a vision. There are voices every day clamouring for our attention and our confidence. And I just want to stop for a second and ask the question, how qualified are they? How qualified are they to be able to deliver what they say they can deliver or how quickly do we follow people who actually have got no qualification at all? I hope you understand what I mean here. I mean, no, not one of you here, I hope, would board a plane if you knew that the pilot loved planes but didn't have a pilot license. Is that a dude who's qualified? You'd be stupid to put your life in their hands. And which one of you perhaps would, would be uh, keen to, well, to be operated on if you needed surgery? You go in and you find out that the surgeon, their best qualification is that they are an animal vet. Would that fill you with confidence? Would you see them as qualified? Every day, you let your life, I let my life, be shaped by voices, values, and visions from somewhere. We just do. We can't help it. It's wired into us. As human beings, we're always looking to find life, and we're always willing to listen to all kinds of angles on that. But my question is, how qualified are they? And I want to say this to you, that the more important the job, the bigger... The bigger its impact in life, you want to have more stringent qualifications, don't you? You want to make sure that the people who are doing that job really are qualified for it. Now, I don't know whether you realise this, but in the Bible, um, there is more said about the qualifications and the characteristics of church leadership than there is on subjects like baptism, spiritual gifts, marriage even, the Lord's Day, all those kind of things. So immediately, that should tell you that God himself takes very seriously who you choose, who you recognise, who you put yourself under as leaders. And this bit of the Bible here tells us, this is the one that you've got to make sure they're qualified. Make sure the leaders that you put yourself under are qualified. Because when you get unqualified pilots and doctors who go about doing their thing, if it's a doctor, well, and they're not qualified, or it's a pilot and they're not qualified, what happens? Well, people get hurt... Lives get damaged and stuff falls apart. And can I tell you that that is exactly the same for your life if you pick bad leaders and bad examples and bad visions, values to listen to and take into your life and act upon. And today we're going to have a little look at this first first chapter of Titus. And the big central thing here is get qualified leaders. What would you say is that, I mean... He's, the Apostle Paul's writing to Titus and saying, right, um, this is the very first thing I'm going to say to you at the start of this letter about how you're going to sort and to straighten everything out. What would you say is the big need of the church to get the church, God's people, living for him? Better singing? Comfy chairs? Fancier building? He says, leaders. Make sure you've got godly, qualified leaders to offer a vision for your life. If we were to pick a central verse from this, if you look down, look down at verse 9 here. This is talking of the leader that they to look to a point. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Look at the strength of this. I, I you can't, you almost can't pick it up in this translation. He must hold firmly. Have any, any of you ever been on a white knuckle ride? You've been on a, a roller coaster or something like that? Okay, and you're like clinging on. Some of you went on the climbing wall over at the neighbour's day the other day. And you start getting disco knee and your knees going. And you cl- you're clinging on for dear life. And you're like, if I don't hold on to this rock face, I'm going to die. And what we're being told here is that the mark of a qualified leader is that they cling on to, hold fast, hold firmly to what? As if their life depended on it. They hold firmly to the trustworthy message, to the gospel about Jesus. 
This isn't something they just know in their head and they can reel off a whole stack of facts and figures from the Bible. This isn't just a you know, vaguely interesting theological information. No, this is something they cling on to for dear life. The content of this message. So that what it does, it doesn't just impact them on a Sunday. Every day of their life, they're clinging on to this message and it is reshaping them and remaking them. They are soaked in the gospel. It captures their heart. They depend upon it. When they succeed in something, they run to the gospel to remind them, I'm nothing more than what Jesus has done for me. When they fail miserably, they run to the gospel to remember, I'm nothing more than what Jesus has done for me. And he has done so much. I am right with God through Jesus Christ. They cling to that gospel and they will be marked more and more and more by the transforming work of the gospel in their life. So actually, if you wanted to, I'm not going to say any more than that. You lot can shut down for the next 25 minutes if you wish. But Paul the Apostle says, listen, a leader will be marked as somebody who clings with every ounce of their being, depends upon, builds their life upon, is reshaped and being made new by the news of who Jesus is and what he does and how that connects you to God for now and eternity. And at this point, I ought to stop and ask, Have you let that happen in your life? Because the really interesting thing, and we're going to see this in a minute, is all the qualifications upon leaders, bar one, is put on everybody else. If you're somebody who has met with Jesus Christ through the power of the Spirit, and you've had your sins forgiven, and you know him as your Lord, then you too will be growing in your clinging on to the gospel for dear life. And we'll see why in a minute. I've just got two points here. We're going to look at this leader and the two points. Number one, um, the mission. And number two, the man. Number one, the mission. Number two, the man. I want to fill out the little story here. So number one, the mission. Now, he's in Crete. Anybody been to holiday in Crete? Yeah, really sunny. It's not quite the same as it was uh, about 2,000 years ago. Uh, Crete, well, well it's, still, it's still right where it was before in the Aegean Sea. But at the time, it was sort of famous uh, or possibly even infamous. It's a little bit... It was a little bit like the Ibiza, um, the party place of the sort of ancient world. In fact, there's a quote here. If you look down at verse 12, even one of their prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. How would you feel about that? You go to a holiday destination, you ping it back on Facebook or whatever, always lazy brutes, I'm sorry, always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. So it was a bit of a party place. It, they were quite, they were quite um, tribal in that there was a sense of pride over the island because myth, uh, the myths um, said that the, the, sort of the original Greek gods and goddesses were born there and lived there and then moved out from there. So there was a whole stack of cultural pride. There was lots of little cities that were very successful commercially so they got plenty of money to play their games with. Um, they, they, would, they would fold in with the usual pagan practice because it was Greek gods. You know the way that it worked back then. If any of you have seen... Um, uh, Clash of the Titans or something, the way it works is there's these rather capricious gods who live on a cloud or on top of Mount Olympus and if you want to be in their good books, what you do is you rock up once a week and sort of like burn a bit of incense or chuck some gold in the pots. Therefore, if you sort of um, act in a way that pleases the gods, then you get a bit of favour and sort of get connected and life goes how you want, but really the rest of the week you live how you jolly well please and who cares. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, this um, prophet who said that quote of them was in um, 500 BC. His, his name was um, Epimenides. And he said, listen, I'm a Cretan, and these Cretans, right, we always lie. And interestingly afterwards, um, the Apostle Paul tags on the end, this testimony is true. Because then you start doing sort of square dancing in your head, though, was he lying about being a liar? Or was he telling the truth about being a liar? No. The Apostle Paul says, uh-huh, I've been there, and them lot know how to lie like the best of them. They're into deceit, they're into trickery. And the problem is, when you are somebody who's a liar and into deceit, you tend to, who's the person you tend to deceive the most? It tends to be yourself, doesn't it, sooner or later. So it'd be fair to say that the Gospel was going to a place where there was a measure of civility, but in that particular culture, they were jacked up, messed up, and they got a load of junk. Happy? And into that, their story of how they lived their life, everybody lives their life out of a story. Uh, That story contains the answers to who am I, where's life found, what is God like, how do I get to connect to him, or many if they thought it was a Greek reality. They add this gospel story, the way they lived their lives, the values that shaped the way they interacted with one another, 
If they thought the gods were liars and tricksy, that's probably why they were liars and tricksy. Simple as that. And they had this gospel story that they lived their life out of. But into that comes another gospel story. That was a false gospel story. In comes the real gospel. Can I tell you that all around us, there are false, fake gospels. There are false messages of where you find salvation. There are false messages of what heaven looks like. There are false messages of where hell is and what hell it consists in. You see? And they had one and they were living it and life was broken. And into this situation, into Crete, comes the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ. And look, it's summed up there in verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Now this is really important, because think there they were in Crete, and the way they thought they connected to truth, to ultimate reality, to divinity, was what they did was they did a godlike thing, and by doing a godlike thing, it connected them to truth and reality and spiritual power in their life, you see? And here, look at the order, it swapped around. Here we're told that there's a gospel message that says the knowledge of the truth, meeting with divinity, getting connected to God, once that happens, then that makes you godly. Do you get the difference? You see, there was a point in the life of the Apostle Paul when he did it the Cretan way. When he said, look, if I'm just good enough, I'm just godly enough, then the heavens will smile upon me. And then he met Jesus Christ and realised as he looked at Jesus that he was never going to be good enough. There is never going to be enough credit in his account. In fact, all he could see in the light of Jesus' perfections was his own failures. And yet Jesus didn't come and lightning bolt him and batter him like the Greek gods would have done if they didn't like you. No, the Lord Jesus comes and says, I know you are bankrupt spiritually, you are spiritually lost, but what I will do is I will come in your stead and I will give you my record of righteousness. And I will take upon myself your record of brokenness and I will go to a cross and pay it in full. I will bring this into your life, this gospel story, and for anybody who has ever trusted in Jesus, that's what's happened. You have received his righteous record and he has carried your failures away. And so the order is changed here. It's not that... Uh, you get godliness and then that puts you in with God it's the other way around this is good news for him knowing that you're jacked up screwed up messed up brings grace into your life you can encounter God and once you encounter God you will never be the same again you will meet him the one who is truth and it will lead you to living godly do we get that can you see the difference You see, one is bad news. I have to do stuff, otherwise I'm spiritually lost forever. The other is good news. He's done what I cannot do for myself. And he loves me too much to leave me as I am. And he's going to do something in my life and bring his power and grace to bear within me. And that's what was happening here in Crete. So the message had started to go out by the various messengers. And people had started to experience transformation and change in their life. And yet, what do we read in verse 5? And this is just such an awesome dose of realism. The Apostle Paul, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So all over the island of Crete, in the society that lives its own gospel story, the true gospel has come in and people have started responding in faith. They've started trusting in Jesus but they're still full of junk. You see, on a Sunday, or whenever they was they gathered, they were like, yeah, Jesus is great, and I'm saved by him. And then Monday, they forget. We're all spiritual amnesiacs, aren't we? We, we have this, every day we forget, oh yeah, Jesus died to save me, I belong to the king, what other people say about me really has been downgraded and doesn't make, make that much difference. My ideas about my life are not as good as his ideas about my life, but we forget that come Monday morning. We can march out of church going, yay, amazing grace, and then next day we're, we're back in the old habits. And in fact, the old habits are unpacked for us in verse 10 and following. And this is talking about people in God's church. So if you're under the illusion that good people come to church, this should deal with it pretty quick. The only people who should come to church are people who know they're wrecked. For there are many rebellious people. This is talking about people who believed in Jesus. 
There are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. They may be, uh, sorry, they must be silenced because they are ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Even one of their own prophets, as they've said, Cretans uh, are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith. So in other words, tell them to shut up! Because they're missing out on living for grace. And the aim of this is that these fledgling new believers, some who are drifting back off to the other gospel stories and living it, and it's wrecking households, put them, get them back on the gospel of grace. Get them to live that. When you spot one of them interpreting a life situation that they're in, in a way not in keeping with the gospel, call them out on it. If they're on Facebook, and they've forgotten that they're Christians, and they've forgotten that it matters that they're representing God, and if they've forgotten that it matters that they're saved by grace, so they don't need to attack back when they got out. Remind them of that same gospel set. If they're acting like they're, they're, they've not met God, tell them to shut up. Why? Because this is a gospel that takes people like you and me, who really have an overinflated opinion of ourselves and our own potential, and this gospel comes and says, actually, even your best deeds are as filthy rags before God. All your motivations are twisted and tainted by your own selfishness, and you rob God of his glory every day. And he takes people like that, and he says, but I love you, and I'm going to change you as you build your life on my gospel story. So what should we expect in church? Carnage. Mess. Not civilised people sitting in a row, sort of nodding, and yes, we're all really quite good, aren't we? No. People who've just got mess oozing out of them, but are slowly being put back together by a saviour who is committed to doing them grace and setting them free that he may be glorified. So what does this mean? What was Paul's answer to all of this? Well, in the midst of this great spiritual work that was being done and with all the junk that is deep down, deep inside of them, what does Paul say is the way that these spiritual babies are going to grow to maturity? Answer again. Verse 5, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders. What's the way that baby Christians get grown? What's the way that stubborn, selfish, self-justifying sinners get challenged and encouraged to stand on the promises of God? Lead us. So let me put it really quickly. Well, the fact that the church is out of control till it gets leaders tells you we need leaders. But I've got a real uphill struggle here. Because even if some of you agree with what God's word is saying here, you actually think it's needed for other people and not you. I know I certainly feel that way. Do you remember the first sin in the Garden of Eden? It was basically them saying, actually God, uh, I'm pretty good at running my own life, thank you very much. I don't need your input, I don't need your help on this one. We have a tendency to kick against the idea that we need spiritual shepherds to help call us back to stand on the promises of God. We really do overestimate our potential to better figure out our, ourselves whilst forgetting that our sin inside tells us lies and tricks us into believing, oh, you are so right. So we do want to run our own, lead, uh, own lives. We do find it difficult to submit to leaders. We will make excuses left, right and centre as to why we don't need them or why we shouldn't let them into our lives. Oh, he just doesn't love me the way I think that my leader should love me. And that gives me an excuse not to listen. Oh, he doesn't know enough. No, he doesn't know quite enough. And if he knew everything I knew, then he would agree with my interpretation of facts. But until he does agree with me, I won't listen to him. Doesn't sound like you want a leader. Oh, he's too young. He hasn't walked in my shoes. What does he know about how God's grace will impact my life? And we will come up with these kind of excuses all the time, and this passage is screaming at us, you're not as wise as you think. You're not as dumb as you might be. 
But each one of us, the gospel tells us we were so messed up, we needed the perfect son of God to die for us. That's how serious we are. You don't need a leader who will give you a few principles. And you, can find a ch- you will be able to find a church within five miles of here that will simply give you a leader who will say, right, follow these five life principles. Follow this ten-step program because you have the potential within yourself to be everything you wished you could be. If it could be fixed by five principles or ten steps, Jesus would not have come and lived and died and bled that you could be redeemed. You and I need nothing short of total salvation, total renovation, total forgiveness by the Lord and Saviour. And he puts people in place to guide us and point us to him when we forget and start going back to other gospel stories. But of course at this point I just need to pause really quickly realising that perhaps some of you you're still at a point when you're thinking through well, what life gospel story am I going to follow? Am I going to follow the secular model that says well basically you've got three score years and ten 70 years or so to live you've got to live life as best you can milk it for all it's worth because basically when you die you rot or have you brought into the gospel story that says you are not an accident here you are precious in the sight of God but you have walked away from him and tried to make your life float without him and it hasn't worked. You've sinned against him and you've sinned against others. But now he calls you back and is prepared to pay your debt so that you can have a new life of him at work with you every day. Clinging on to him, depending upon him, trusting his wisdom over your own. Turning away from your addictions, turning away from your escapisms and leaning wholly and enjoying the blessing of knowing him. Walking with God. And I know some of you, you're still at the point, which way do I want to go? Please, can I just say to you, go with the, go with God. That was what you were made for. Your heart will be restless until it finds its rest in Him. That's what you were made for. And isn't it exciting to see a church in in infancy, a church here that's just beginning to realise that people who are, people who are just having that awakening, and all the junk that goes with it. You know, sometimes we've had church prayer meetings where we've got together and we just pray, Lord, win new people, win new people. Have you got any idea how painful and messy it will be as that happens? Have you got any idea how much we're going to have to depend upon the Lord to give us strength and patience and a heart of love to go out to people? Because we always expect that as we come into church, people are sort of being made new by Jesus and gradually growing and trusting in him more and having the rough edges knocked off over time. It takes a long time. And wherever we are in the conveyor belt, we don't assume that there's going to be anybody coming in behind us with more junk than we've got at our current point. That's a bit unrealistic, isn't it? And we need leaders who are going to lead us through. So if that's, if that's the mission of a leader here... Let's find out a little bit specifically about the man. And this is found in primarily in verses 5 through to 9, and I'm going to read it with fear and trembling again. So have a little look down. For the reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, the husband of but one wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly, cling on, to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. And you read that and you think, yes, the six million dollar bionic pastor, here we come. I read that with absolute shuddering, but um, with fear and trepidation, I'm going to go through this knowing full well, you're like, he's not like that. John certainly ain't like that. Gosh! (laughs) Okay? And then I'm going to get to verse 9 i show you the engine room behind verses 6 through to 8, okay? So, let's start in verse 6. Here we go. Right. And I'm filled, oh, by the way, I'm filled with optimism here, by the way, because Titus is supposed to appoint elders out of those who were at one point or another described as always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons given to addiction. So in other words, 
that was what the elders said. Please don't think for a second, I'm going to come back to this one. You don't go and find somebody who's really nice, naturally, and make them a leader. That's not what Paul was anticipating here. He was expecting you to find an absolute divvy who hated his kids, was unfaithful to his wife, was um, going out and getting hammered all the time, screaming through off the handle, went straight to Gas Mark 9, would, would, would talk with his fists. That was who he was before he met Jesus Christ. And as he has taken that gospel into him, and as he has been restored and made new, and has got new affections and new hopes and new ambitions, he has been changed to the point where he's about to fulfil this list. Do you believe in a gospel that is powerfulness, powerful enough to exercise that level of change in the life of a scally from speaking? Or a self-absorbed student from London? Paul seems to think that our gospel can do this. In fact, some of us have the pleasure of having one of those guys as a pastor of our church from the Bridge Chapel. Bill Bybro's brought up in the dingle, boxing champion, or kicked around with his... I'm not going to go into all that he got up to. I'm on a godly man who's had masses of fruit from his ministry and a huge church up the road that's five, six hundred strong. This is the power of the gospel. This can happen. So let's get into it. Let's have a look. What are the qualifications? Here we are. Well, the first lot found in verse five, uh, sorry, verse six. An elder must be blameless. The husband of but one wife, a man whose children, uh, sorry, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. So an elder must be blameless. Can I tell you that doesn't mean sinless? That means blameless. What does that mean? It means there aren't any blaring inconsistencies so that if somebody who never sort of knew that I was a Christian walked in and saw me at the the, the front of the church going, Him preaching! What? Him? They wouldn't say that. Because there is a consistency that matches life and lip, lip. So that consistently over a period of time people recognize a pattern of growing godliness and dealing with the various junk and issues in their life. Somebody who has that mark. And I think some of the Bible commentators, the people who study these bits of the Bible much more in depth than I've got the time to do, look at that and they say, well, that's the big thing. Somebody who is blameless, who is not necessarily merely respectable or more civilized, somebody who loves God and it is impacting their life so much that every sphere and area of their life is being brought under the control of the gospel increasingly. Somebody who is blameless, not sinless, and then there's the whole stack of things that unpack what that might look like. Okay? The husband of, of but one wife. In other words, he only has eyes for his missus. He is faithful. He's not playing the crowd. He is a one woman guy. Why? Because God is a faithful God. He's got to be a picture of what God is like. Is this guy growing in his faithfulness of loving and serving and building up his wife? and seeing her nurtured and brought on. Because if you can't do that with your missus, you're going to struggle to do that with your church. Next one. Oh dear, and if you're a parent of teenage kids, you shudder. A man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. I dare any parent here to put up their hand and say that at one point or another their kids are not wild and disobedient. Oh, that hand went down pretty sharp, didn't it? I, I dare any child to put up their hand to say at one point or another their parents aren't wild and disobedient. So what does this mean then? What does this actually mean? Children who believe... The, the, the closer translation of that is children who are faithful. It doesn't mean all their kids have to be... Um, have memorized the Bible and are, are, are better prayers than the elders. They, they've all professed faith in Jesus. No... It's about the management of their home. Has this guy managed his home in such a way that his kids know right and wrong, respond when they're called to, have respect for people who are older than them, have a family pattern that is in keeping with the gospel? Okay? So in the home, kids, are they faithful? Does this guy manage his household well? How does he respond when his kids do mess up? Are they fearful of him? Is he just cold and heartless and beats them with a stick? That's not consistent with the gospel. In fact, if you want to be able to... uh, Quick tip, two points, two things you need to be able to manage kids well, very simply. Number one, you need to be the best thing that is on offer. Number two, you need to be very clear when they've gone wrong. What do I mean by that? Your kids need to want to follow you because they know that you love them. 
So when they walk away, coming back to you is actually a relief to them. Do you get that? Second of all, you've got to know what is wrong so that you love your kids enough to be able to call them out and they know that they must not mess because they know that when you are disciplining them, you are disciplining them with a vision for their future. It's not motivated by your own self-centeredness. And so here is supposed to be a model of a family. It does not say we appoint people to leadership who have no family problems. No, what it means is I want to appoint people to leadership who when there are problems within the family, when their kids do go through phases, which they will inevitably come, this fella manages it well. Because if he can't do that in his little dinky family, it doesn't bode well when he's gang- dealing with a gang of people who are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons, but as big as him. Yeah? So first arena, qualification of a, of a leader will be in the home, they're managing their home very well. Second arena, and this comes up in two, two sections, is basically the conduct and there's, uh, there's, there's five negatives to be avoided and six positives. Five negatives. Since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, it's to be a steward of God's work. So in other words, he's representing, he's put in management over God's house to act in line with God's wishes. So he'll be leading people. Um, and as you look at the overseer, you should see something of what God is like. Um, there's these five things. He must... Um, again it comes up as blameless there but not be overbearing, not quick tempered, not given to drunkenness not violence and not pursuing um, dishonest gain, not overbearing overbearing carrying the idea of I will force things through because it's in my self interest to do it, oh by the way I have to say these five things are really important because they're all about how you build community, in the Bible there are certain sins that if you Let them fester within your life. They just screw you up, primarily. But there are other sins that you can have in your life that if you let them loose, if you nurture them, they they just blow community up. So here are five that just destroy community. Somebody who's overbearing just wants to please themselves and is out for what they can get. Second of all, quick temper. They're like a firework. You know that's a mess. You're working with them. Maybe it's a church get-together. Maybe you're trying to do some sort of initiative. Maybe it's a Wednesday club or welcome club or something like that. And there's one person, it's just like, whoa, up to daisy. <laughs> Done. That destroys community. You don't want a leader who's that. You want a leader who's the opposite because God is the opposite. God is not quick-tempered. He is slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. You have to do a lot to get him to fly off the handle. You know that. You really do. And so you want a leader who models that because they've got a stability that comes from knowing that God has been gracious to them when God could have flown off the handle at them. Not given to drunkenness. Not given to addiction. And not somebody who's mastered by escapism. Can I tell you that there was a big reason here why we put drunkenness down? That, well, not we, the Bible puts it down. Is that drunkenness has this particular ability to just, what happens is your inhibitions lower and so the real you, without social constraint, pops out and it just goes after people. So you don't want a leader who is given to drunkenness. Not violent. Will he hit out and deal with it with his fists first? Not pursuing dishonest gain. In other words, trying to take advantage of people. Because when you're in a position of responsibility, you have people who will look to you and it's easy to take advantage of people. I tell you, it's really easy to take advantage of people when you're in a leadership position. Look for somebody who's not one of those. But on the other hand, positively, six here, somebody who's hospitable. That doesn't mean he's great at cooking a pot roast. Hospitable talks about welcoming to outsiders. Listen, the assumption is is that all of us have been given resources, opportunity, blessing, and means. They're given to us by God. And when we don't know God, what we do is we tend to hoard them for ourselves and not let other people in. We use them to bless us. When you you come to faith in God, what you suddenly start to do is realise, wow, I've got all this stuff, and I've been using it to build up me and to glorify me. I want to use it to serve and let other people in. So we have a little saying around our table quite often. We work with this one with the girls as much as we can. Why does the Lord give us blessings? Answer, so we can use them to bless other people. That is at the heart of hospitality. Hospitality is you saying, I've got maybe a strong family structure and I've got means at my table. And what I do is I welcome other people under the umbrella of that provision and of that stability. 
We want to be marked, and I've said this before, and I, I, mean, I said this to the fellas not so long ago, we want to be marked that those of us particularly who are men know the kids in our church. And we put them under the sphere of protection, under the sphere of provision that we have. Some, some of the youngsters in our church haven't got a dad at the moment. So we, as dads, will offer hospitality, as in open the strength of our lives and our families to them. I want it so that when people come running in for the first time, they look around and they can't guess whose child belongs to which set of parents. Except for Weston's a bit of a dead giveaway. Sorry about that, mate. Um, but you get the idea is that the kids are so loved, we've offered out that stability, that hospitality. It happens in the home, but it happens in the church community too. And the elders are to be those who are modelling that and leading the way on that. So if you should look at the families that, that bring stability and invite and open their home to strangers, you should look around and the ones leading the way in that should be the elders. And by the way, can I tell you, at least for John and Kosh at the very least, that's what I see and that's a blessing, so thank them for it, okay? Let's carry on. Let's carry on. Uh, not, uh, here we are. Um, rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. I don't even want to go there because I look at that now and I think, oh dear. I might better fool you. My wife is sitting in the back and she's smiling, smirking here to get here again. See, I can fool you lot. Some of the time. Some of you have known long enough so that you know. Okay. Some of you have still got you under the spell of illusion that I'm actually a nice guy. Ask my wife and she will tell you totally otherwise. So that's why I, I want to do verse 9. Can you see verse 9 again? Look at it. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message. That means when I read that and I say, here be blameless, I see Jesus. I look at that description and I see Jesus. And I'm not Jesus. But Jesus says, his blamelessness will be credited to my account when I lean and depend on him. His perfections, his faithfulness, his self-control, his holiness, his uprightness gets credited to my account when I trust in him. And when I see that and I hear that, that changes the kind of guy I want to be. When I know that I am safe and secure and don't need to battle for his love, when I know I have got his unconditional faithfulness and love, his unconditional faithfulness and love pattern here is something that I want to be more and more. I want it more and more in my life. And if you're a believer too, you want that as well, don't you? You can't help but read through that and say, do you know what? I want people around me like that and I actually want to be like that for other people. So what is a leader to be? A leader is to be somebody who every day cannot do these things unless they grab hold of the gospel and take their stand on the gospel every single day. My wife will tell you about this. I don't mind confessing my sin publicly. On the days when I don't get up and read my Bible and I don't get down on my knees and preach the gospel to my soul, I'm an ogre in the home because I'm not clinging to the gospel. But when I cling to the gospel, and my first waking thought is, get down on your knees, boy. Remind yourself that the only reason you can come before God is because of what he has done for you. Remind yourself of the huge treasure and the sense of privilege that he has lavished his eternal riches upon you. You are you're, you're a son and heir. An heir. Realise that your, your sin wants to grab a hold of you and pounce on you and crush you. Think of your sins yesterday. Confess them to God because you're safe enough to because you know he's dealt with them when I get down on my knees and I preach the gospel to myself every day I start doing that I start being that but when I don't I'm horrible and I get to the end of the day and I think I shouldn't even be an elder I shouldn't even be a pastor and can I tell you interestingly that when you speak quietly to both John and Kosh their testimony is the, tr the same isn't it exactly the same So a leader is to be somebody who is recognised as just being a repentant man who is seeking to live in the power that the gospel provides. 
Listen, I'm not a nice guy. Some of you say, oh, yeah, but, you, but you're a nice guy. No, I'm not. You just happen to have caught me on a day when I put the gospel on. I am an evil brute by nature. And if I stop believing the gospel tomorrow, I will be horrible. And do you know what? Some of you will be as well. In fact, all of you will be. So what is the elder to do? What is this man to do? He is simply to be somebody who does not put his confidence in his own abilities. He does not put his confidence in his own good character. He puts all his confidence in the finished work of Jesus. For every look he has at his own performance, he looks back at Christ countless more times. He lays down his deadly doings. I must do this to affirm and capture and be secure in God's love. No, Christ has done it all. Lay down your doings and put your trust in him. And then when you see other people living for other gospels, people in your church family, the leader is to go after them and call them back. Take your stand on the gospel today. Live the truth of the gospel. Knowing that God is gracious to you and you do not need to live like that. He has set you free. But he has not freed you to live for those choices. He's freed you to live for him, depending, leaning, trusting, clinging. So a leader is just an ordinary Christian who clings to the gospel in a way that everybody around can see it and see him growing in it. Lord willing, over the next three or four months, we're going to move very quickly towards the process of appointing another full-time elder. Can I tell you, you want to be able to see in him evidence of a repentant heart and a trusting heart and a fellow who just clings to the gospel and wants to help and encourage others to do that. And he's even prepared to get in people's face to say, believe in Jesus. Don't go anywhere else. And when you see people who are trying to do that, when you see people who are pushing on, when when the church corporately has recognized leaders like that, who aren't perfect, who aren't blameless, but are seeking to depend on him, put yourself under them, and when they speak, listen. Because God has put them there for your good. That you may grow and know the freedom and the grace and the joy of standing under the gospel. Of course, there's the other temptation. What we could do is we could just try and put up people who we pretend and like to believe are perfect, then what we do is we gather on a Sunday morning and somehow say, well, I'm part of a church with some perfect guy up at the front and maybe just by sitting and listening to him I can somehow catch the, the greatness and the goodness disease and it'll impact me and I'll be made... No, it won't. That's no gospel at all. The true gospel is of a saviour who breaks into the lives of even people like me, John, Kosh, the scumbags who is going to be appointed elders in Crete and says, I'm going to make you new by my grace by leaning grabbing hold of, clinging, being soaked in, depending on the God who will not let you fall and gives you a desire to live for him rather than your old empty way of life. Let's pray together. Lord, when we open passages like this we begin to realise how much We've yet to grow. But we thank you for the promise of your faithfulness. That you have given yourself, your truth, your salvation because it will lead to godliness and it will make a change. And we realise that so often we're tempted to try and carry on our own self-salvation projects. We're tempted to believe our own wisdom and our own interpretation of the facts. We're prepared, Lord, to think that we can make it on our own. We even try and push away those you've given us to help us grow. And we ask, O Lord, that you would help us to cling to that gospel. Believe that you are the God who loves us. That no matter how far we have fallen, no matter how thick our sins, they are not so big as the Saviour cannot save us. No matter how much we fear that we will not measure up, he has measured up for us. We thank you for the destiny that he has made and purchased by his own blood for us. And we thank you that you have given to us those who would lead and help us to take a stand in it. We pray, O God, as we come as a church to a time where we're looking to appoint new leaders, that you would help us to recognize those who cling, hold firmly to the trustworthy message. 
can encourage others in it and can point out when others are not living according to it. Please, Lord, give us shepherds, pastors, elders, overseers who love you, who are kept from sin, who are growing in blamelessness, who are pursuing hard after Jesus, that we all may be built up to be who you would have us be as we wait for eternity to come. Lord, be merciful to us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're now going to sing of the climbing wall that we can climb onto and climb into and will hide us away. This is an old song, Rock of Ages. I just wonder, Rory, could you just... um, Here we go. This is the bit. Look at this. Not the labour of my hands can fulfil thy law's demands. Everybody happy that we won't live up to God's law? Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. You got that? So even if I was the most keen and zealous believer ever, even if I'd shed tears for my failures, all of that couldn't take away my sin. Thou must say, and thou alone. And he has done. Click on one more for us, if you would, Rory. There we are. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. I'm a leader, I can cling to that. No, I can't. I'll cling to Jesus. I'm not a leader, I can cling to that as my excuse. No, you can't. You cling to Jesus. Naked I come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me saviour, or I die. Let's stand and sing together. Click back up if you would for us, please, Rory. (laughs) 